Okay, welcome to the next class on variational methods for computer vision. This is chapter four. <coughs> uh, last chapter, chapter three, we saw one of the core components of variational methods, the Euler-Lagrange equation, that defines this extremum principle. The minimum of the energy is attained if the Euler-Lagrange equation is fulfilled, so that is a necessary, but as we saw in general, not sufficient condition. Today we'll see a couple of examples of variational methods in computer vision and the associated Euler-Lagrange equation and also what we discussed in the last chapter, the gradient descent equation for some of the functionals. Uh, the reason why I give uh, these examples is to give you a better feeling for what variational methods do and how a certain cost function can represent a certain problem in image analysis and computer vision and, how, uh, and what the corresponding uh, differential equations are that define the, the minimizer. <coughs> uh, there are six parts in today's chapter. Uh, the first is inverse problems and image restoration, the general concept of what an inverse problem is, and some aspects like well-posedness or ill-posedness that you have heard some of the terminology that is used in that field. Uh, then we'll see some examples, image denoising uh, once more and image deblurring. Um, and then we'll see uh, a little more general uh, how you can formalize inverse problems and how you can derive appropriate functionals from uh, a statistical inference point of view. And so in that sense, uh, today we'll go in some sense one level higher. In the last classes we talked first about image filtering, uh, PDE-based filtering with differential equations. Then we saw that you can set up variational cost functions where the gradient descent is the differential equation, is the diffusion, for example. And today we'll go one step higher and check where do cost functions come from? Can we derive the most suitable cost function for a certain problem? For example, in the last classes I already mentioned, we often use quadratic data term, quadratic smoothness term. Can we use just the norm? Yes, we can. What is the difference? What are the consequences? When would we use one model? When would we use another model? And then we'll talk about more applications, motion blur, motion deblurring, defocus blur, and in the end an example called super resolution. <coughs> Inverse problems have a long history, is a very central, important problem in applied mathematics. Uh, an inverse problem is nothing but the conversion, I wrote it here, of measurement data into some information about the observed object or the observed physical system. So you have some system or object, you take measurements and you want to infer from the measurement something, some property of, of the object. And this is, in applied math, is called an inverse problem. Uh, sometimes the same uh, problem is also called a problem of inference, where you try to infer some property of your object from the data. And so it's a particular mathematical problem, and in this context there is a very important definition of mathematical problems that goes back to Hadamard in 1902. And he said a mathematical problem is well posed if it fulfills if and only if. So this if with 2f, by the way, means if and only if. So this is an equivalence. A problem is well posed if and only if it fulfills these three conditions. The first condition says that there should, a solution should exist to the problem. The second is the solution should be unique. So there should not be multiple solutions. Um, and thirdly, the solution's behavior should change continuously with the initial conditions. Or in this setting, with the data, with the, once we change the observations a little bit, then the solution be, should change a little only. So this is a property of continuity in some sense. Uh, you can imagine that this is useful because if you solve problems and the solution changes drastically, if the input just changes a tiny little bit, that is usually something that you may not want in a solution. 
you want a certain notion of stability. So in other words, the solution should not be affected too much if I perturb my extra initial conditions. That's not surprising because if you take an image, you know, then brightness values can change a little bit due to noise, but your interpretation about what is in the image should not be drastically affected by, by uh, tiny changes. In practice, nevertheless, most inverse problems are actually ill-posed. So that is the opposite of well-posed, meaning they don't fulfill all these three conditions. For example, the measurement data is typically not sufficient to uniquely characterize the observed object or system. And so already the uniqueness property is typically not fulfilled. There are often multiple solutions, there is certain ambiguity about which solution is the right one. And often multiple solutions match the observations in the same way. So they explain the observed data in a similarly well. And so to disambiguate the problem and, and basically favor one among the multiple solutions, one typically introduces some kind of prior knowledge. Meaning if the observations don't tell me which is the right solution, do I have some prior knowledge that helps me to disambiguate? To say among the many possible solutions which one is the best one which one is, one would say, in statistical setting, a priori, most likely. And in the variational methods, we'll see that a little later, this prior knowledge is what gives rise to the regularity term. In the denoising, we said a priori, we will favor solutions that are spatially smooth. And we measure that smoothness in the, very, in the regularity term, and so that really encodes our prior about what solutions are more likely without actually looking at the data. <coughs> Let's look at the specific example. Uh, so image restoration is a very broad field. It's a classical inverse problem. Uh, the, the, uh, the idea is that you're given an observed image, F we'll call it, uh, and some typically stochastic or probabilistic model of the image degradation process, so some process that degrades the true image. And then what we, um, what we want to ob uh, restore is the original image. So the observation is somehow related to the original, the true image, and this is what we want to restore. A simple example, this is uh, written in a rather abstract way, what, what I mean by image restoration and what I mean by degradation process, but I'll try to give you some examples to make it more concrete. The first example is the image denoising. We often start with that because it's the most accessible in some way. The idea here is that the true image differs from the observation by the fact that at each pixel you have some additive Gaussian noise. It need not be Gaussian, but let's assume the additive noise is Gaussian zero mean with a, a standard deviation sigma. And so if sigma is larger, we have more noise. Also, you know, this is additive noise. You can also have multiplicative noise. There's many different noise models. And what I'll show you is actually, depending on what noise model you choose, you typically have a different variational method to do denoising. For this Gaussian additive Gaussian noise model, it's actually the most frequently used model. It doesn't mean this is the, the noise that you really have in real cameras. It actually isn't, but it's st still used most frequently uh, to some extent because mathematics become simple. The Gaussian noise model actually leads to a quadratic data term. And this is yet another explanation why people favor the quadratic data term because it corresponds to a Gaussian noise model. Rudin, Osher and Fatemi in 92 proposed to denoise an observed image f by minimizing this cost function. And as you can see, again, it contains two, it has two terms. Actually, I skipped, there is a lambda, typically a weighting parameter as well. I dropped that here. 
but usually you would have some waiting lambda in front of the regularizer. It has two terms, as you can see, a quadratic data term, and then in contrast to what we discussed in the last couple of uh, chapters, a data term which is called the total variation. This is a data, uh, sorry, a regularity term uh, that is extremely popular. And you can imagine one of the reasons why it's popular is because it's convex, right? This norm is a convex function and the integration is just a summation of various convex functions. So the overall expression here is convex in U. The data term is also convex, it's quadratic. And so the overall cost function is convex, which means we can mi minimize it globally. Which means if we set up the Euler-Lagrange equation, this is it, then there is only one solution to it. Nevertheless, you see one of the difficulties we get, since the regularizer is not quadratic, the derivative is no longer linear. In fact, what you have here is the divergence of nabla u divided by norm nabla u. I, in the slides, I don't actually have the derivation of this Euler-Lagrange equation. We leave that to the exercises. Because it's actually very useful for all of you to really derive Euler-Lagrange equations for yourself. This is an excellent exercise to get a more hands-on understanding of, of this Euler-Lagrange equation. But to recap a little bit what we discussed in the last uh, section is if you have L of u and the derivative of u dx, then the Euler-Lagrange equation is dE by du is dL by du minus d dx and then dL by du prime, right? And then the Euler-Lagrange equation says that this functional gradient should be zero. If you use this energy and plug that in here and, and compute this derivative, you see dL by du is just u minus f, right? u minus f squared. If you take the derivative, the factor 2 cancels, you get u minus f. And here, if you take the derivative of norm of something with respect to that vector, you get this expression. You get the vector divided by the norm. So this is a unit vector in the direction of gradient u. And then the d by dx is nothing but this divergence in, in more dimensions. This is the derivative operator in multiple dimensions. <coughs> and so you can see, indeed, it's not difficult actually to derive this Euler-Lagrange equation. It's very much standard calculus, just plugging it into this, into this formalism. And then we get this equation. In fact, if you do gradient descent, let's drop the, the, the data term for now. The gradient descent of this, by the way, maybe I should mention that, is just the negative of this, uh, of this expression. And without the data term, we get divergence nabla u over norm nabla u. And what you have here, I'll write it a little more explicit, w explicitly, is 1 over nabla u norm times gradient u. And this, anyone recognize what this equation is? What kind of equation do we have here? du by dt is divergence of this diffusion, exactly. So we, again, we have a diffusion. This is not surprising. A lot of smoothness regularizers lead to a diffusion in the gradient descent. We saw for the Dirichlet energy where you have a square in here, you get a linear diffusion. And once you drop the square, you get what's called a nonlinear diffusion. And in fact, this thing here, we call the G, is the diffusivity. And what we see is this is a diffusion process which, uh, with, with, a, with a diffusivity that decreases the stronger the gradient. Right, so the, the stronger the gradient at any given point, the smaller the diffusion. And so it's an edge-preserving diffusion process. And in fact, uh, since this is called the total variation, often uh, in shorthand called TV, this is called TV diffusion. And this particular 
differential equation. It's very popular, I would say at least as popular as the Perona-Malik diffusion that we discussed last chapter. The only difference is it appeared two years later. Perona and Malik were, in that sense, really pioneering because they came out with their nonlinear diffusion in 1990. This rudin Osha-Fatemi model, sometimes called ROF model, you have acronyms whenever things get really popular. The ROF model appeared two years after the Perona-Malik model. But both of these papers were extremely influential in the scientific community. Here's an example. <coughs> this I took from one of our papers. Now you might say, why do we publish something in 2012 on TV denoising if the whole thing was done 20 or more years ago? The issue is that what you see here is color images. And the rudin osha fatemi model, the original one, was for gray value images. U is a scalar image, a gray value image. And it turns out once you generalize to color, some things are, are very easy to generalize, some are more tricky. And it turns out there are actually many variations of total variation for color valued images. The most naive one is to just sum the different components, the total variation in the red, total variation in the green, and total variation in the blue channel. But it turns out this is not the smartest way to do. This is the most popular way, but we argued in this paper that there are better ways, I, I, because you want to preserve discontinuities. You want to denoise in a way that you preserve jumps. And what's crucial is you don't want the red channel to jump in a different location from the blue channel. If the red channel jumps here and the blue channel there, you get color artifacts. So you want a formulation of the total variation which assures that energetically the jumps should coincide. So if, if in any location the red channel jumps, ideally blue and green, if they have a tendency to jump, they should put their jump in the same location. And it turns out you can do that and you can even assure that they jump in the same direction, etc. And so this is what we discussed in, in this paper. And you see, this is the input, it's a somewhat noisy image, this is the output, the denoised version. Of course, the output will not look exactly like the original, but it's actually fairly close. And until today, the total variation is one of the most powerful regularizers. Not necessarily because it's the most suitable cost function to model the problem, but it's among the convex cost functions possibly one of the most suitable ones. And what we see in the last years actually, the last three or four years, people go towards non-convex smoothness terms. But the issue is then it's very hard to find good minimizers, because if your cost function is not convex, then things get a bit tricky. And in general, it will not be possible to, to determine the provably best solution in a polynomial runtime. This is where you need convexity, typically. And so this is why total variation is, to date, still very popular, and as you can see, it gives very nice denoising results. You can use these, for example, if you have a digital camera and you take pictures in the dark, often this is what you get. And some, uh, more and more actually, a lot of the, uh, the consumer cameras have some kind of denoising algorithm inbuilt that automatically gener generates maybe not this result, but something in this direction. And so this is one area where such techniques can be used. Here's the next problem. So this was denoising. Let's generalize it a tiny little bit. We said before the denoising, the noise model was U plus Gaussian noise. Now we do a little different. Now we say what I see, the observed image F, is generated from the real world true image by a real lens. And one of the things that real lenses do is they blur things a little bit. 
if the structure you're observing is not exactly in the focal plane but slightly outside the focal plane if your focus settings are not perfect then you will invariably get some kind of blurring and so here the assumption is what we observe is a blurred version of our of our uh, original uh, of our true image u plus additive gaussian noise and so what you see is gradually we're bringing in more and more realism into our uh, image acquisition model before we said observation is the true image plus additive noise now we say well there may be some blurring as well and the blur kernel is a and now here's the this sim for simplicity we would assume that a is constant in a real world image we we'll see in a second this is actually not the case in fact, if you have a lens, there is a focal plane where things are in focus. The more you move away, closer to the, to the camera or further away, the more things get blurred. And the blurring increases the more you get away from the focal plane. So the assumption here is, in, in other words, in this context, that uh, we are not in the focal plane, but we are looking at the structure that is planar and parallel to the focal plane. In, and then the blurring is actually constant at any point. And to invert that process, what do we have to do? We, have to, we can say, well, find an image U that is such that once I blur it, it is similar to F. And in addition, it should minimize the total variation as a regularizer. Again, you see I don't have a weighting term. In the practice, you would have a lambda parameter in front. This functional leads for symmetric kernels to this Euler-Lagrange equation. And this, I should say, is a little more involved to derive. You can do it. It's, uh, it's an exercise, and I suggest try it. And uh, the best way, actually, I find to derive this expression is to go back to this uh, gâteau calculus and, and look at how the directional derivative is defined and carry that through for this convolution that you have in here. To recap, for those who don't remember, f star g is defined as integral f of x minus x prime, g of x prime, dx prime. This is called a convolution, and this is what, and if A is, say, a Gaussian, then this is a Gaussian blurring. And what you see in this uh, Euler-Lagrange equation is, again, you have this term, this you know, it comes from the total variation, it is the TV uh, diffusion term, if you do gradient descent. Here is the gradient descent, and indeed you see du by dt, just looking at the smoothness term is divergence, nabla u, by norm nabla u, that is the TV diffusion in here. And the data term, if we look at this one, what does it say? Well, if u is such that a star u is f, then it's zero. That's good, that should be the case. So if the data term is perfectly fulfilled, meaning a star u, a convoluted with u is f, then that term should no longer have any influence on the evolution, because that term is happy, so to speak. If it's not exactly zero, then the change that is added is minus the blurred version of that, you could call it residuum, right? We call this residuum, the discrepancy between what we want and what we really observed. And so this is the gradient descent equation. The next thing is this is convex. So here again, the gradient descent will lead you to the global minimum. Here is an example. I should say, again, this is 2011, right? TV deblurring was done a long time ago. What we have here is a deblurring with a more sophisticated regularizer. That is not the total variation, but something more sophisticated. But nevertheless, I decided I always have to find a trade-off between showing you examples to the theory, but I also want you to sh want to show you things that are not 20 years old. <laughs>
and so this is a little more state of the art I should say but what you see is the input is this blurred version and what you can get nowadays is a fairly sharp version which is not exactly like the original but it gets you closer to the original I believe so, yes. So the blurring, we use a Gaussian kernel and then we use, a, a as I said, a, a little more sophisticated regularizer. And one of the properties you see is that the regularizer preserves sharp discontinuities, boundaries, and so the output looks sharper. So these are examples of inverse problems, denoising. Here we have the deblurring example. Uh, what we see is there is always a certain cost function that allows us to solve the problem. The question is where do these cost functions come from? And so what I wanted to discuss now is a statistical framework that allows to derive an appropriate cost function for a certain problem. The framework is quite old. It goes back to a, a, um, a man from the clergy uh, uh, called Thomas Bayes, and he proposed in the 19th century already a framework which is nowadays called Bayesian inference. Uh, and there is one here you have it, 1887. He proposed a formula. I believe this as well was published posthumously. Um, um, and he proposed this formula which is today known as the Bayesian formula. The idea, maybe to put it before I go into the equation, is that you have a true image U and you have an observation F. And what you want in practice is you want to invert that process, you want to get back from F to you. And the issue is that this process is typically not deterministic. If I have Gaussian noise, there is a lot of uncertainty in how exactly I get from the true object to the observed object. And so, in some sense, what the Bayesian formula allows you to do is to invert this problem in the context of statistical uncertainty. The idea is quite simple. It goes back to probability theory. If you have two events, let's call them U and F, then the probability of U and F is the probability of U given F times the probability of F. For those who are doubting, let's assume U and F are two specific e events. For example, uh, one is that it rains today, and the other event is that the street is wet. And now you want to have the probability that both of these events happen, that the street is, is wet and that it rains. And the probability for that to happen is, first of all, it has to rain, so you have the probability that it rains. And then you have the probability that the street is wet if it rains. And similarly, for symmetry reasons, you can rephrase it in the other way, P of F given U times P of U. And now if we look at this and, and solve this for P of U given F, for example, we, we just divide by P of F, so we can rewrite the conditional probability for having U given F is the probability for F given U times P of U divided by P of F. And so this generally holds for any kind of uh, events U and F, you have this equation. <coughs> In the context that F is the observation as here, and U is the, the model state that we want to uh, infer, this is called the posterior. How likely is U, any system configuration or object state, or any, the true image, how likely is the true image given the observation. This is called the posterior. And uh, one way to solve inference problems, the statistical approach, would be to say, given the data, find 
the most likely interpretation u <coughs> for the given data. This approach is called the maximum a posteriori estimation. Has anyone not heard of this before? Okay, one, very good. So this is called maps, maximum a posteriori, sometimes short map. <coughs> and the goal is to find the most likely uh, uh, interpretation of a given data. Turns out that all of these expressions have names. This one is called the likelihood. It basically says, given the true configuration, the true image, how likely is a specific observation? And this we can typically model explicitly in the context of saying we assume the observation is the true image plus additive Gaussian noise, then basically what we're doing is we're modeling this likelihood. And this term, also important, is what's called the prior. It says how likely is any function u a priori, meaning without actually looking at any observations, how likely is a given interpretation, u. And now you can see, basically, the observation in practice, when you do inference, the observation is fixed. The image observation, you have it, it's given, so f is fixed. And then you are maximizing this with respect to u. And so, in other words, we are maximizing p of u given f and computing the argument that maximizes this. And this is actually nothing but the argument maximizing the product up here. Why? Because this term down here is a constant factor. It doesn't play a role in the maximization. So the argument is not affected. I could write here divided by p of f, but that wouldn't change anything. Since f is constant, is given, then p of f in the maximization with respect to u, p of f is a fixed constant. And so what you see is the most likely configuration is a configuration which maximizes this product, which both explains the data very well and is a priori very likely. So for example, if the observation is that the street is wet, F is the street is wet, and U is it's raining, and I want to know is it raining, then I can try to maximize this posterior. And that would tell me, well, if the street is wet, if it's raining, then indeed the street is wet, so this is indeed very large. And then you have a prior, which basically tells you, well, how frequently does it rain in this specific area? And then if you are maybe in, in uh, um, Bielefeld or so, then the prior for rain is very high, at least to my experience. <laughs> and so the interpretation, it's raining, is very likely in, in, a, in a place like Bielefeld. Uh, nothing against Bielefeld, but whenever I was there, it was raining. And in other places, as you know, maybe in California, in LA, it just doesn't rain ever. And so the interpretation is raining, is, is even if the street is wet, it's going to be unlikely that it's raining. More likely that the neighbor is sprinkling his garden. Right? And so, so the observation alone doesn't tell you about what the right interpretation is. What's crucial is to have some prior. And priors can be very helpful. The same data will lead to a different interpretation if you have a different prior. And if your prior tells you it never rains in that place, then, then the interpretation it's raining becomes very unlikely. So this is maybe an example of how the same likelihood, depending on the prior, will lead to very different uh, interpretations, very different posteriors. And so this statistical framework is extremely popular in the entire field of data analysis. Because this is something not only in image processing, but in any domain of data analysis and in, in most scientific domains. You have some unknown configuration U and you observe something. Ideally, of course, this observation is somehow related to your true state, 
it must depend in some sense. If F doesn't depend on you, then it's useless as a measurement. So, of course, you want measurements about your system that somehow actually depend on the system state. And that is the one aspect here, and the other aspect is to model the prior priors, how likely a priori are different scenarios. And the prior, it, it may look very abstract, but it's actually very easy. You know, if we talk about does it rain or does it not rain, you can get a prior just by, you know, uh, taking a histogram over the last 20 years. Did it rain? How often did it rain? And that, that is exactly the prior. How often on average does it rain? And of course, you can see, you know, in, for example, in certain places, it always rains in a certain season. So you can have priors that are seasonally dependent, right? And in one season, the prior for rain is high. In another season, the prior for rain is low. And so this is how you can indeed uh, model very sophisticated priors. And in the end, this approach is extremely popular because it allows you to compute the most likely configuration, the most likely system state given the observation. Allows you to compute uh, is maybe a bit simplistic. It depends on whether you can actually maximize this expression down here. And so in the end, we'll see in a second, this also leads to an optimization problem. It is an optimization problem, and so aspects of convexity, or in the maximization of concavity, equivalently, are important. Let's look at a very specific example, again, denoising in this statistical Bayesian inference framework. Can we really boil down the denoising all the way to a pixel level, to a model of what's going on, and derive an appropriate cost function. And so this is what we'll do here. We'll use a Bayesian inference approach and derive a cost function. And ultimately what we do is we compute a maximum a posteriori, and this will be a variational problem in our setting. Again, as in the past chapters, we will always, for simplicity, step back to a discrete setting for the beginning and assume that we have n pixels. And I call them independent pixels. What I mean is that each pixel measures the true color, ui, and the measurement is corrupted by additive Gaussian noise. But independent means the noise for one pixel doesn't depend on the noise for the next pixel. There is no correlation. So that may be a somewhat simplistic model, but it actually works fairly well. It's very much like your sensor array has lots of pixels and, and the measurements are perturbed by Gaussian noise. And so the measurements only depend on the color at that pixel. And you can say the likelihood for an observation, if I given the true color, is Gaussian distributed around that true color, right? So I have a true color. If I have colors here, the intensities, then I have a true color for that pixel, I call it Fi, and then the observed color is Gaussian distributed with some standard deviation sigma around that observed, that, uh, um, that true color. Now, I said, I assume that these are mutually independent, the various measurements, fi. So the measurement fi depends on ui, but it does not depend on fj, for example. I put all the measurements in one vector, call it f. These are all the measurements, the brightnesses, the observed brightnesses of the n pixels. And similarly, u is the vector of the true intensities, ui. And then P of F given U, this is what we need to uh, write uh, for this Bayesian approach, right? We model the likelihood here, P of F given U, P of observation given the true configuration. And now I said the observations are N brightnesses, but all of these observations are mutually independent. Independency in a statistical context says A and B 
are independent if the probability for A and B is nothing but the probability for A times the probability for B. This means A and B are independent. So this is basically the definition of independency. In fact, if we go back to this Bayesian framework, oh sorry, here, if u and f are independent, then u does not depend on f, so p of u given f is the same as p of u. It doesn't matter what f is. And then you have it here, then it just says p of u and f is p of u times p of f. So this is independency, and in our context it means we just have a product of these likelihoods for each pixel. A product over all pixels of p of fi given u. Next, we assumed, obviously, that the observation at pixel i only depends on the color at that pixel. It doesn't depend on the true color at other pixels. And so we can write p of f i given u is just p of f i given u i. Doesn't depend on the other pixels. And then we can plug that in here and we get that product of a lot of Gaussians. Products are typically not very nice. We'll see in a second what you can do to get rid of products. Um, what we now do is, so this is rewriting the likelihood. Now for the Bayesian approach we need to write uh, a, a, a prior. The prior P of U is P of U1 through UN. And now we can write here P of U1 through UN, we can write it as P of U1 given U2 through UN times P of U2 through UN. This is actually, if we, I go back one slide, is nothing but this here, right? P of U and F is uh, of 2 is P of the first given the second times P of the second. And so we take the first one, and then this is the remainder, is u2 through un, times p of u2 through un. This is just rewriting, and then you can imagine what we can do now is we can apply that same rule recursively, and always say the probability of them all is the probability of the first given the rest, times the probability of the second given the rest, times, etc., etc. So we, you have a product of a lot of terms. And now, what I will assume is what's called a Markov property. The Markov property is a very popularly used property. It basically says that the probability of ui, is uh, the prior of for ui, is sufficiently characterized by its direct neighbors. Yes? Oh, very good, yes, indeed. In the end, we should have probability of un. I drop that assuming it's constant. And so, indeed, in the end, you have times p of un. And I drop that term and just put proportional. Why? Because the slide wouldn't fit it anymore. <laughs> But you're quite right that the factor that I neglected in saying it's proportional is P of U n. How likely is the very last one? Indeed. And the assumption, so you would have here product of i equals 1 through n minus 1, P of U i given U i plus 1 through U n, times in the end you would have P of U n, as you mentioned. And now you see it, the color for i at pixel i depends on all the neighbor colors. And now what I assume is that this prior is sufficiently determined by knowing the direct next neighbor. So the approximation, the mark of approximation, is to say p of ui given ui plus 1 through un is the same as p of ui given ui plus 1. This one would say is a first order mark of approximation, so the neighborhood is just the neighbor pixel. There are generalizations where you take the next two neighbors, etc. And so this is why here I approximated this by saying it only depends on the direct neighbor. <coughs> 
This is a somewhat simplification and you can imagine this property is actually not fulfilled for certain types of structures. Let's say we want to denoise zebras and we know the object we're looking at is a zebra. If the stripe pattern of a zebra is one black stripe, one white stripe, one black stripe, one white stripe, then this model works in the sense that the prior for black is, uh, if the neighbor is white, then the, sen the pixel I'm looking at should be black, because I know it's black and white, right? But if you have two black stripes and one white stripe, then the probability for this being white depends on if both are black or if just the direct neighbor is black. And so you can easily imagine to model more complex structures than a simple one bar white, one bar black, you need larger Markov models, larger neighborhoods, etc. And this actually is a huge challenge, how to model more realistic textures of the world with appropriate priors. And so this is where the Markov property is a simplification which, which is algorithmically helpful but which doesn't capture the reality well enough. But for now, let's work with that, and we'll see how far we get. In this context, we don't want to denoise zebras. We don't want a prior that generates zebras, but we want smoothness. We want denoising, and smoothness can be easily represented by direct neighborhood information. In fact, let's look at what we do. We say a simple smoothness prior is to say, as I said, we can represent it as P of ui given ui plus 1, and then the product over all of these, and then we say ui is likely a priori if it's the same as the neighbor. If, my br if the brightness at pixel i is the same as the direct neighbor, that's good, then it means there is no change in the brightness, and so this I favor in, in this exponential way e to the minus lambda times ui minus ui plus 1. Why this particular model doesn't matter. This is called a Poisson noise model. Um, but you can, uh, you can have other smoothness terms. Sorry, not noise. This is misleading. But it's, it's an exponentially decaying term with the norm of ui minus its neighbor. But you could also consider quadratic term here, if you like. So now we have a model for the prior, and we had a model for the likelihood, and now the Bayesian formula tells us the posterior is nothing but the likelihood times the prior, essentially. Uh, and then that needs to be mac uh, maximized, so we need to maximize the product of this term times that term. As I said, products are usually not very popular. People don't like, you know, from, an, from a mathematical point of view, products are, are not, not very easy to handle. And so what people do is they get rid of these products by applying the logarithm. This is an important concept in optimization, whether you maximize the posterior or maximize the logarithm of the posterior doesn't make a difference. The reason for that is that the logarithm is a logarithmic function. So if this is s, then we have log s here. It's a, uh, sorry, not it's a monotonous function. So this is monotonously increasing, and that means if you are at a maximum of your cost of your uh, probability, you are also at the maximum of the logarithm of that probability. So, in other words, maximum u f of u is the same as maximizing u log f of u. It's not the same cost, but the argument is the same, and the problems are equivalent. And then, by convention, one applies a minus sign, and that just flips the whole thing. Right, so whether you maximize the posterior or you minimize the negative logarithm of the posterior is equivalent. Because the logarithm is strictly monotonous, it doesn't affect the, the optimization. 
but it converts the products into sums and it converts the exponential of the minus this thing into just the expression itself. And in fact, if you wondered why do we use an exponential here, actually for that reason, because we know later we'll apply the logarithm and then it cancels out with the exponential function. And so the a posteriori maximization of this expression here is equivalent to minimizing the negative logarithm and that then simply reads the product over all pixels becomes a sum over pixels and this is just fi minus ui squared over 2 sigma squared and then here we have lambda times ui minus ui plus 1 norm. And since there was a proportionality to here, so there is a constant factor that indeed I, I omitted, uh, uh, in the logarithm that becomes a constant add-on. But as I said before, constants in the energy are not important for the optimization, so we can safely just ignore them. And so what you see, interestingly, is that this approach that we already saw before for denoising an image can be seen as a maximum a posteriori estimate. For a specific observation model, additive Gaussian noise, independent pixels, and a specific smoothness prior, this one here, we get this cost function. And so the link between the Bayesian inference approach, the maximum a posteriori approach, and the variational energy minimization approach is simply the minus logarithm. Right? So the energy is nothing but the negative logarithm of the posterior. This is a very key relationship, and in fact, if you ask why the minus sign, it's all just conventions. There is no, you could directly maximize the posterior, you could maximize the logarithm of the posterior. Some people do that indeed, but some people, the convention is often to write negative logarithm because that is then energies, and this is, a lot of these inspirations are actually from physics, and in physics you typically have energies to represent the world. But you could equivalently represent things with probability distributions. And so this can be seen. Minimizing this cost function uh, leads to the maximum a posteriori estimate. The most likely u given f under these model assumptions I just showed you. And now you see, if I make different model assumptions, if I assume a different likelihood model, not Gaussian additive noise, but a different noise, you can plug that in here, and you directly get a different cost function out. And you can see it if you don't use Gaussian noise, but what I call Poisson noise, that would be just the norm here, e to the minus norm without the square, then you would get a data term that doesn't have the square. And so depending on whether your camera is better represented with Gaussian noise or with Poisson noise, you would choose for Gaussian noise a quadratic cost function and for Poisson noise just the norm. And if you have yet other noise models, plug them into this Bayesian approach and compute the cost function that is the maximum a posteriori. You can do the same in a continuous setting. <coughs> and there you would say the likelihood for the observation f, given the true image u, is in the context of Gaussian noise, this expression. You recall in the discrete setting we had a sum over pixels. In a continuous setting we have an integral over pixels. And similarly, the prior is given by this expression. So this is the likelihood, this is the prior. And the posterior is now uh, um, the likelihood times the prior. And then once I apply the negative logarithm, I get this cost function, the rudin osher fatemi model we saw before. Quadratic data term and this so-called total variation regularizer and then some constant which I can safely neglect. 
This is an extension of that Bayesian framework to a continuous setting. It turns out, from a mathematical point of view, it's actually a little more complicated. The reason being that when you do a more systematic derivation, you're actually talking about probability distributions on these infinite dimensional spaces. Because if we have a function u now defined on some continuous domain, then this is an infinite dimensional object. And there is actually a number of open challenges in, in the domain of extending probability theory to infinite dimensional spaces. But for this class, uh, I decided to not go into technicalities here, so in practice this is, is, works quite well. There are certain issues, certain technical uh, difficulties, but, but we'll just ignore them for, for the sake of this class. Let's go to other examples of uh, image restoration. <coughs> um, this is an example that you're all familiar with. It's called motion blur. So this is also a particular kind of blur that doesn't come through the lens itself, but it comes through the fact that your camera or the object you are taking a picture of is moving. And as you know, any real camera has um, a lens, and then the shutter opens, but it doesn't open instant, it doesn't open uh, for an infinitely small time amount, but you need to have it open for a certain time to acquire enough photons, enough light to actually get a reliable measurement. You have to leave uh, uh, the shutter open for a certain time. And so that time, let's call it T, and ideally, as you know from photography, the object should hold still for that period of time. And if they move, especially in, in dark environment, then you get blurring. In dark environment, of course, because I need to keep the lens open for longer uh, to get enough light in if I have dark and uh, if I don't have enough light. And then so, especially if you take pictures at a party at night and the lighting conditions are bad, then you will see in the next day that things are blurred. Maybe you will also remember them as blurred, but that's a different story. <coughs> So, can we model that blurring? It turns out, yes, we can, and so we'll make a very simple assumption here. We assume that the object moves, but we assume for simplicity that it moves with a constant velocity. So, in other words, the object doesn't hold still, it's moving, but at least we assume it's the, the movement is constant during the aperture time. And so then what we observe, the observed intensity at any pixel x and y, and here, for simplicity, we'll also assume that it moves in the x direction, but the model can be easily generalized to other motion. But it's a little easier in x, for, for at least uh, for the notational simplicity. I assume motion in x direction. You see it moves. What do we observe? The true color is the observed color, but then we have a displacement that uh, uh, scales with time, and that is the v is the velocity vector here, and so the true observation, uh, the observation is the true image of the object, but then since the object moves, we you see the color at slightly displaced points. This is a simple translational motion here in x direction, so y, the y component is not affected. You can rewrite this observation based on the true uh, intensity f by writing <coughs> it, uh, we can insert x prime to represent v times t, so then we have x minus x prime, and dx prime is v times dt prime, so we have to do 1 over v to have this equal to that. And then if t goes from 0 to t, then x prime goes from 0 to v times t. Uh, so this is a sim simple substitution. The reason why I do this substitution is I want to write it as a convolution. And you can see that, in fact, this motion blur model, 
can be written as a convolution of the true image f with a blur kernel h and you can make these two equivalent by choosing this blur kernel. What is this blur kernel? Well, the blur kernel, you see, we integrate from minus infinity to infinity. The blur kernel in the x component is non-zero, in fact, one, if and only if x prime is in this interval zero to t. Then we, this is one, and then we aggregate this information. Uh, the term one over vt is up here. And then in the y component, we just have a delta function. And if, as you may remember from the calculus with delta functions, if we integrate over y prime, it, it, this term is non-zero if and only if y prime is zero. So it contributes only for y prime is zero, and then we get f of y here. And so the whole integration over y that we have here is in some sense added artificially and it, it's just removed. Once you plug in the delta function, you get back to this expression. But as I said, what we have here is a convolution, is a standard convolution. And so now we could do motion deblurring just by taking that particular convolution kernel h plugging it into the variational approach and do TV deblurring with the motion blur kernel. The assumption, of course, being that we know the motion V. Difficulties in practice, you don't have the motion. And so one of the things you can do is you can try to assume different velocity vectors with different magnitude in different direction and see which one gives you the best result. Or you can try to estimate the velocity along with the deblurred image. And so motion deblurring is, in that sense, a little bit more tricky. But if you know in which direction and what velocity you had, for example, if you take a picture of a racing car, then typically by looking at the picture you see in which direction the car was driving and you even know that the race car typically goes at 250 kilometers an hour or whatever they do, right? And you can plug that velocity estimate in here and it will give you a fairly good deblurring. Here's an example of motion blur. This, this is artificial. I generated this artificially just to show you. This is a blurred image, and it's blurred in the x direction. And so you can see the transitions in x direction here. This, for example, get very blurred. Wherever you have transitions in y direction, you don't see that blurring. So this is, in some sense, you would call this an anisotropic blurring meaning it's not blurred equally in all directions, but differently in different directions. And so variational deblurring would amount to using an appropriate blur model, maybe a motion blur model with some maybe guessed velocity or some estimated velocity, and then plugging that into the variational approach. If you minimize it, then you get a deblurred image. There is another kind of blur, uh, just to show you that blurring is a, a very common phenomenon in image analysis, but there are very different blur models around. The blurring in the last case came through the motion of the camera, through the fact that the lens was open for a certain time, and in that time the object moved. And so the observed color was always from a different location of the object. Um, I said another case of blur is through the lens. In particular, if you have thick lenses, then they create a substantial amount of blurring. Often in image analysis, people make the assumption of what's called a pinhole camera. Pinhole camera. And the idea is that the whole image formation process, if you have an object in the world here, right, uh, then that object can be the image of that object on, on your uh, camera, on, the, on your screen, uh, or in the camera, is obtained just by a pinhole. This is called a pinhole. 
And so all the rays go through this hole in, in here. I didn't draw it properly, but there is one hole that they all, where they all go through, right? Um, and as you know, this, the, the pinhole camera in principle works, and it was actually devised uh, more than 2,000 years ago. And people could show that you can create images of the world in that setting. You just have to create a sufficiently dark room here. And if your object is sufficiently bright, uh, then this works. Um, the problem with that for real world imaging is that typically the object is not sufficiently bright to get enough light into it. And in fact, you get a more and more accurate model if you make the hole smaller and smaller and then you get less and less uh, uh, photons into your, into your, uh, on your screen. And so you to have any, of course you can get accurate imaging if you just wait long enough, right? If nothing changes in the outside world, if the illumination, everything is fixed, then you can wait forever and then you can get a very sharp and accurate uh, model of your object with the pinhole camera. The good thing about the kin pinhole camera is that everything is focused, so even objects further back, they're all focused. Uh, in practice, however, the world moves, you don't want to wait forever to acquire the, uh, a good image, and so what you do is you introduce lenses in front, and these lenses kind of ref refocus things, uh, but they have an effect that they have a certain focal length, and so at the f distance of the focal length, typically called f, at that distance, objects at that distance from the camera are in focus, but if they move away from the camera, they get gradually more and more blurred. And this blurring is called focus or defocus blur, and the idea is that the more the object gets away from the lens, so if you have your lens here, and the object moves, uh, this is then the focal length, if the more you get away from the focal plane, or the closer to the camera away, the more blurring you get in both directions. And so this is a very prominent blur that you get with real-world cameras, and in particular with thicker lenses. You always have it with any kind of lens, but the thicker the lens, the stronger that effect. And in practice what you will see, if you don't have a planar scene, front to parallel scene, but a, a realistic scene with a certain depth, what you will observe is that the blurring becomes space variant. Meaning, the blurring in different locations has different amount. What you have here is the same, exact same scene, but captured with three focal settings. In the first focal setting, the apple is in focus. In the second focal setting, the orange is in focus. And in the third focal setting, the background is more in focus. And so you can see that you have a space-dependent blurring. In this example, for example, the background has little blurring, whereas the apple has a very prominent blurring and vice versa here. And so this is a blur model uh, that, um, that uh, is space dependent and the challenge is it's not only space dependent but it depends on, on the scene geometry. And this is a bit nasty on one side but it turns out, and this is the amazing thing in, in the field of image analysis, a lot of nasty effects can be exploited to good use. One of the things, for example, you can do is you can look at this problem and, you know, typically, historically, people would have said, oh, that's bad, I'd rather take a pinhole model and then I don't have that issue and try to not have too thick lenses and, and the world will be okay. But then some people went there and said, wait a second, the amount of blurring that we see in these images, can we not use it to determine the depths of the scene? In other words, if the structure is not blurred, then I know it's in the focal plane. If the structure is blurred, as here, then I know this is not in the focal plane. It must be a certain distance from the focal plane. 
And in fact, you can go that far as to explicitly model how much blurring do I have depending on the distance from the focal plane. And you can well approximate that with Gaussian blurring, where the sigma is a space-dependent sigma, or more specifically, the sigma depends on the depths at any given location. And if the depth is different, then I have a different sigma, a different amount of blurring. And so this is something that uh, um, Paolo Favaro and uh, um, Stefano Soato set out to do, and in fact they actually wrote a book with Springer on uh, uh, de-blurring, and it contains a lot of uh, mathematical techniques to solve these problems and to generate depth maps from uh, defocused images, yes? Isn't that how uh, autofocus works in cameras as well? The, the autofocus is related, so the autofocus is something that you have in cameras, and indeed the autofocus, uh, so the manual focus typically you set the distance of the scene, and, and then it, de it determines the focus appropriately, um, or you set the focal settings directly, but they correspond to a particular distance. Um, the autofocus, what it does indeed, is it creates, it, it tries to find a focal setting that makes the whole thing sharp. And, and so there are sophisticated algorithms to determine the sharpness in a certain location. For example, you can compute the gradients, and if they're very high, then you are in a focus. Uh, in a f then you're in focus. If the gradients are low, then you're out of focus. And so, indeed, the amount of blurring is, as you say, used to determine the focus automatically. But if you can set it manually, you can take different snapshots with different focal settings and then reconstruct the geometry of the world. One of the assumptions in all of these methods, including the autofocus, but here as well, is that your world is textured. If you look at a white plane, forget it. Right? If you have a white plane, how do you want to know if it's in focus or not? It's white. Right. And if you blur it, it's still white. So, And if you compute gradients, they're all zero, right? And so you see that, in fact, even with digital cameras, if you, if you have a, a white wall, you can, you know, you stand in front of it. Unless there is any kind of texture in the wall that on a fine scale is perceivable, it's not going to work. It, you know, it's not going to get the right settings. And so this is a phenomenon that uh, haunts us in image analysis in any application that we need to have a textured world. But I mean, this is the same for human eyes. If we were living in a uniformly colored world with no brightness variations, you know, then I, I say we wouldn't have eyes because they wouldn't be any good. And so, in some sense, the fact that humans have eyes and that they strongly rely on their eyes, actually more than on any other sensory device they have, tells us that this assumption typically is a good assumption. The world is textured and, and so computer vision will also work. In fact, here's examples. These are uh, examples taken from the paper, uh, a paper of Paolo Favaro and co-workers that appeared in 2008. Here you see again two images taken with different focal settings. Here, for example, I believe the toast is in focus. Here, the background is in focus. And it turns out two images with different focal settings are enough to generate this depth map. Uh, it takes a little bit time to get used to these depth maps. What uh, This is a color encoding of the depths. Bright means foreground, so down here we're very close. And black means background, so here we're very far back. The accuracy of this depth map is, I would say, uh, not terrific. Right? You can hardly see the handle here. But it's probably sufficient for a robot to localize itself or to avoid obstacles, etc. At least obstacles of a certain size, let's say. 
And moreover, I find the reconstruction is very impressive given that you are just working with two images of different focal settings. Here is another example. Uh, these are the two images. Uh, when I look at them, I realize humans are not terribly good at this. I guess I don't really see much. But you see, again, in all these examples, in these examples, uh, the author made sure that uh, things were textured. I know because I was working in the lab when he was doing the experiments, and I know he constantly came and asked me if I have textured objects. And... Um, so I found out that whole grain bagels are better than plain bagels because plain bagels are not very textured, but whole grain bagels are more textured. And he took so many snapshots of my bagel that in the end I couldn't eat it anymore because it was completely stale. And so this is, in some sense, you need to have the, the textured assumption for the approach to work well. Um, um, the question, and this is an important question, is what do you do in, in, in areas of the image where you don't have texture? And in, 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 in our world, we always have some areas that are not textured. And, and, and in these areas, typically, you need some kind of fill-in. So from the textured areas, you can infer based on the amount of blurring their depths. And in the locations where you have no texture, you need uh, fill-in. Because the data term doesn't tell you anything. And this is where good regularizers are very important. Because the question is, what is the prior? If you don't know anything, if the data doesn't tell you anything, what does the prior tell you? And there are different priors. Total variation is a popular prior. For geometric reconstruction, it's also popular. But it turns out it's not the most suitable regularizer for these problems. The reason that total variation is popular is it favors planes. If u is your depth, right, u from omega to r is your, your depth at any pixel, then the total variation of u given by nabla u norm dx is zero if u is constant. So if you have a plane, a frontal parallel plane, then the total variation is zero. And so in other words, what you can expect if you do total variation defocused deblurring, or, um, um, then whenever you don't have texture with the total uh, variation prior, it will try to fill in with the plane. That's not a bad feeling, I would say. The difficulty for geometric reconstruction, and the same, by the way, if this is brightness, it will favor constant brightness. The difficulty with geometric reconstruction is the total variation favors planes, but only frontal parallel planes. As soon if, as I have an inclined plane, an inclined plane would be something of the form AX plus B, that's a plane but not front or parallel, then the total variation is not e difficult to read out. It's just A essentially times the size of the image. So TV of U, right? The gradient is just A. B is a constant, disappears, and then nabla U is just A. And so you have A norm integrated over the image, so you have A norm times the size of the domain omega. And so all of a sudden, you see that the penalty grows the more inclined the plane is. That's very bad. I have planes in the man-made world, but I don't know how they're facing the camera, right? They could be front to parallel if I'm lucky, but in general, they're not. This total variation regularizer, although it's used extremely frequently for these kinds of problems, it will favor front to parallel planes over other planes. Turns out there are more sophisticated regularizers nowadays that don't have that preference and that favor any kind of plane, so there are improvements on this. But these are a lot of the aspects that we need to take into consideration when modeling variational methods. What is a good likelihood? What is a good prior? And a prior that favors planes is good. A prior that prefers the front to parallel ones is maybe not so good. Typically, you still use total variation even for these kinds of problems because it's convex. 
because it has many f nice properties in terms of optimization. It can be efficiently minimized, etc. Of course, there is a preference to frontal parallel planes, but you know, better some prior than no prior is usually the. So, so there's in the whole domain of optimization and image analysis, there is always a trade-off between what would be the best theoretically principled approach and what is practical and, you know, typically in the end the compromise rules. But you see, you get nice geometric reconstructions just from two blurred images. You might ask, what is this good for? It actually turns out this technique is quite useful. The question is, how else would you get geometric information from images? The standard way, the stereo approach, is that you take two or more cameras and take pictures from different viewpoints. Well, sometimes you cannot do that. If you do endoscopy, for example, and you you know you get a camera inside the human body, I'm sure the patient would not be happy if you say, "Can we put three cameras inside your body?" Right? That doesn't work. Here, you can use these techniques in principle for this, right? Because you can take a picture from the exact same location and just change the focal settings of your device. Take a picture with one short focal length, one with long focal length, and you're ready to go. And you can reconstruct geometry without having to put two cameras in, you know, into the vein or where the artery or where, wherever you are. And so there are scenarios where this actually is quite useful. And it's actually fascinating to see how many techniques researchers devise to get geometric information from images. And just taking a different viewpoint and then putting into correspondence, etc., is one classical approach, but it's by far not the only one. And this is a, a very different approach where you use the lens blurring properties to infer geometry. Uh, this is the last example of an image restoration approach uh, called super resolution. There are various approaches in the context of super resolution. What I look at here is uh, super resolution from standard video. The idea is that you have a video camera and maybe you move the camera around or maybe the world moves, doesn't really matter. And the assumption is that you want to recover an estimate of the scene that you observed in a resolution that is higher than your camera's resolution. At the first glance that sounds impossible, but it turns out you can do it. And what you use is you exploit the fact that you are did you have a continuous world? So here is your continuous world and you discretize your world in the digital camera and what you observe basically in each pixel here is an average of the brightness in that location. And now assume that I take another camera image with a different grid and in a slightly different orientation and then what this camera gives me in this brightness here is an average over the brightness in that patch. And the idea of super resolution is to model that effect that digital cameras have. So not just a blurring, but a downsampling as well. A digital camera has a lens that blurs the world. Uh, and then it also has a downsampling because the brightness is basically accumulated over the area of that pixel. And that's just an averaging of the brightnesses in that, in that patch. And the idea is if you to take very many different averages, then basically you can figure out what the brightness in, 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 this, in a more localized actually is. And so what we have to do in this restoration approaches, as before, we have to devise a model for this image degradation. How does the sharp world uh, um, get into an observed image Fi? And the idea is shown here. We assume that the observation Fi is nothing but 
um, and this is the, actually if i is the image i from 1 to n are the n images that i take of the scene and then i say the observation fi can be explained by uh, uh, a blurring uh, and a downsampling so, sorry this is the operator a creates the a, some linear operator that clear, creates a blurring and a downsampling and um and the W is the motion of the camera or of the world. So WI is the motion field, the displacement that I had. The difficulty in super resolution, or one difficulty, is that typically when you have a video sequence, you don't know the motion. So in practice, you have to estimate the motion first. And it turns out this is in some sense a chicken and egg problem and actually to date there is no convincing solution to the problem. The chicken and egg problem in the sense that what I observe are very noisy, low resolution images. If I compute a motion field on these images, it's going to be a low resolution motion field because the input is low resolution. And so in practice, I would want to compute the motion field on the high-resolution images. But these I don't have. To compute the high-resolution image, you, I need to have the motion and the low-resolution images. And so in the end, you see there is this chicken and egg problem. I need the motion fields accurately, and I need the images sharp and high-resolution to get high-resolution motion fields. There are two ways of to, to tackle it, or the, the standard way is that you typically compute the motion field first on the low resolution images and somehow hope that it's good enough. And then you do the deblurring, meaning you compute the high resolution brightness function. And in more sophisticated approaches, you try to alternate this process. You compute the motion on the low resolution images, you compute a set of high resolution images using super resolution, and then on the high resolution you compute the motion fields again and hope that you get sharper or more accurate motion fields and then you keep iterating. Yes. So this variational approach is nothing but, at least in terms of the data term, it amounts to saying uh, that we have the tr observed image is the true image transformed with the motion field. So WI is the motion field, some typically displacement field, and then a blurring and a downsampling that happens. And then a, uh, an additive noise. In this case, since we have no square, it's actually not a Gaussian noise, but a Poisson noise. If we were to use Gaussian noise, we would put the square here. Which noise, as I said, we use depends on what noise model works. In practice, what people do is they try different noise models, different cost functions, and basically check what gives the best performance. If you don't know what the true noise model was because someone sent you the images and you know you don't have access to your camera, uh, then you then this is a good way to work is to try different noise models and see which cost function gives you the best results. <coughs> the question is what is the best result? If you don't have the the true high resolution images, you know, this approach will give you some image. There are two ways to check which approaches work uh, w uh, and which parameter settings are the best. Um, one is that you synthesize a low resolution downsampled image from a true high resolution image. You synthesize a sequence of low resolution images and then you can try to infer the original high resolution ones and try to find parameters so that it works best. But if you have real low resolution images and you don't have the true high resolution images, the so-called ground truth, then what you can do is you can um, you can just uh, you know try different parameters and see by eye what gives the best results. For example, if if you have to deblur and uh, super resolve a license plate, then typically the human eye is a good way to check: can I read the license plate? How well can I read it? And that gives you information about which parameter settings are good. 
the motion, I didn't go into detail, these WIs, uh, that really depends if you have a, a, you know, a translational motion, that's a simple motion to apply, it just means you translate the image grid before evaluating you. But in general, you would have some non-rigid motion. And as I said, additive Poisson noise that gives the norm here in the cost function. Here's an example, and as I said, you know, the human eye is often used to evaluate. This is one of typically five or six images from a video sequence, and here you see the super resolution estimate. And now, uh, you still can't really read what's written here, but at least somewhat better than in the input data, right? So you can at least, with some uh, effort, recognize what this was. Yes. And so this is, this is actually a little bit of a difficulty in this domain, that you only have these two ways to to do performance evaluation. One is uh, that you check with ground truth data, but that means you're working in a more synthetic scenario. And the alternative is that you compare by you by eye and the performance if you have real world data. And so ideally what you need is you have to have synthetic data that is as realistic as possible. And so you have to have, when you generate the synthetic data, your model of the image degradation, the blurring, the downsampling, should be as close to what your real camera does as possible. And the idea is, if the model is sufficiently good, the model that represents the camera, then the parameter settings that I optimize in the syn synthetic scenario should also work in the real-world scenario. Question is then often how many parameters do you have? Here it's actually not too bad. Uh, we have a blur kernel, we have some downsampling factor, and we have this weight of the regular riser. So it's not actually too many parameters to try, and typically you have a good understanding what parameters have which effect. In practice, actually, the lambda value will be chosen fairly small because what you want is a sharp texture, and so you don't want too much smoothness. But at that point, people would say, well, why don't you just drop the regularizer entirely? Why don't we set lambda to zero? Well, then we lose uniqueness. For these variational methods, I mentioned we want well-posedness, we want uniqueness of the solution. The question is, if I only have finite amount of data, then it's actually impossible to infer an infinite dimensional function u. I only have finitely many measurements, and the question is, the algorithm has to know what to do in between. And so the regularizer basically says, fill in with the ideally constant functions, or as constant as possible. And so even a small value of lambda typically assures uniqueness uh, uh, for at least certain classes of cost functions. Okay, this is all I wanted to say about image restoration to give you a bit of a better understanding of what variational methods can do and what, how we can derive them from statistical settings and what applications we can tackle. Thank you. <laughs>